So um, who wants to read this? Can I get a volunteer to read this first statement? I, I can. Thank you, uh, Steve. Mm -hmm. Millions of our citizens do not now have a full measure of opportunity to achieve and enjoy good health. Millions do not have protection or security against the economic effects of sickness. The time has arrived for action to help them attain that opportunity and that protection. So folks know who this was said by? Any guesses? That was that was Truman back in 1945, still timely today. Um, how about uh, this? Somebody want to read this? I can read it. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. Of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. And I believe that was MLK. Indeed it was. Um, absolutely. So how about this? This might stump you. Who wants to read this? So, so I'll read it. Nobody dies because they don't have access to health care. Any guesses? That sound familiar? So that's Raul Labrador. He was um, actually, a, 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 I believe, a senator or a representative from Idaho. He's now their attorney general. Um, and that's a perspective that you may hear in the red states in your encounters with colleagues or, or patients. <clears throat> Anybody want to take a guess at this? Who wants to read that? Can I get a volunteer? I can read it. The ballooning costs of health care. The ballooning costs of health care is a hungry tapeworm on the US economy. Any guesses? So here's this guy from Omaha, right? Buffett, Warren Buffett. <clears throat> Um, so, um, this uh, healthcare obviously can be looked at from a lot of different perspectives. Um, as budding physicians, um, you will be looking at it from your patient's perspective. How the health system affects your patients actually will take primacy to a lot of what you're learning in medical, medical school right now. You're learning physiology, you're learning um, biochemistry, you are learning how to apply science to your patient's care. Uh, but what we're talking about in this session is something that um, you will be hitting up against throughout your careers and hopefully being able to make some impact uh, on improving care. So, by the way, so um, I teach at Dartmouth Medical School. It's now called Geisel School of Medicine, named after Ted Geisel's, uh, the, um, the maker of um, Dr. Seuss. We sometimes call it the School of Dr. Seuss. Uh, and uh, again, as is the experience in the 21st century, many institutions are now privatized by name, if not by intent. Um, and uh, so I teach on doctoring and um, first and second year students uh, for many years now. Uh, and again, it's I, I think you guys get this, um, uh, but I think that hopefully um, uh, some of this can be translated to your other courses if you haven't had much experience in this. So anyhow, the objectives for this session is uh, defining the scope of primary care, reviewing the role within various health systems of primary care, and talking about recent challenges um, that, that we've experienced. So the term primary care first had its origin in 1920 uh, from the United Kingdom. Um, and this Dawson report described how primary uh, care uh, health centers uh, would be envisioned to be the hub of regional services. That's the origin of what we'll see in many other countries, that primary care is not secondary to a hospital system, a hospital health system, or to a insurance health system, but it's actually um, has primacy within a community setting. Um, so that's something just to bear in mind. Um, in the United States, primary care was first described in 1961. And again, um, it started to describe what we call the four C's. So this uh, first contact, um, continuous, uh, comprehensive. So um, uh, those are three of the four C's. 
I'll come to the other one. Uh, so basically, the, this notion that it provides an ongoing care for the whole person within a complex social system. Um, and again, definitions can vary. Um, the definition, and by the way, I get you'll have this on the uh, tapes. I could also up. This will also be on Google Drive, and you'll be you'll have access to our tapes. By the way, to our um, to our slide sets. So earlier definitions um, refer to the primary care physician's responsibility for a patient longitudinally throughout a lifetime. And regardless of whether that person you're caring for had disease or not, or you're just preventing disorders or disease, um, coordination is that fourth C in a complex healthcare maze. Um, and so the primary care is defined on that basis. Some folks will define primary care simply on the basis of the medical specialty that you're practicing, whether it be family medicine or general internal medicine, PEDS or OBGYN. So you'll hear it in a lot of different terms. And this is, a, again, a quaint um, last century um, a theme of the primary care doc examining this young uh, girl's doll who may go on to be, has already taken care of her parents and may go on to take care of her as she gets older. And actually, if you get to know folks real well, they'll They'll sometimes quilt you these things as I have hanging behind me. Um, so um, in terms of these definitions, I don't want to belabor this, but it is important to recognize that it's person focused. It's not disease oriented. It's care over time and it integrates aspects of care. Barbara Starfield did a lot of writing about this. I have references to some of her research on this topic. Again, primary care being that first level of professional care where people present with their health issues or health problems. And as we'll see, where the majority of a population's care is satisfied of interest. Um, World Health Organization, again, some of the four Cs we've already talked about, um, and people-centered. So anybody know who this guy is? No? I can't see you all. I'll, I'll scroll down. Any positive nods? Any recognition? It's so interesting. So I grew up in the 19, you know, I was born in 54 and grew up in the 60s. This was part of my life into the 70s and, and 80s. 1980s ER was was on television, which that was that was something we used to watch. I'm not sure you guys know what television you guys know what television is, right? Yes, good. All right. So back in the 60s, this is Marcus Welby. He was the paradigm of a primary care doc. Um, again, he was white, he was male, he was paternalistic, but uh, he provided uh, care to the folks who he um, was responsible for. Back in the 1960s, 70s, even into the 80s, this fo uh, folks like Marcus Welby um, uh, owned their own practices for the most part. 85% uh, of primary care docs were self-employed in small practices. They may have a couple of partners to do coverage. Um, it was a simpler time in some ways. As you might know, the world of medicine has uh, been turned upside down in recent decades by corporatization and financialization. So that even 10 years ago, 56% of primary care docs remained self-employed, but the rest were employed by large uh, health systems. Uh, and by 2021, um, uh, fewer and fewer doctors are, are self-employed, and that's not just primary care physicians. The 21st century has seen a, a, a change in what a primary care practice might look like. There are larger practices. They're typically within a, a multi-specialty uh, group practice. The concept of a team with multi-professionals, uh, RNs working at the top of their license, physician assistants, nurse practitioners, care managers, all of that is part in, uh, of what primary care looks like in this day and age. They're also organized around electronic medical records and a whole host of new incentives, uh, including performance metrics uh, and um, uh, relative value units, which we'll talk about in this um, program. Any of those terms sound familiar, by the way? Just curious, relative value units, are folks familiar with that? Um, it's, it's how uh, physicians are reimbursed, and we'll be talking about that uh, through this uh, um, session, through the sessions. So we talked about the UK envisioning a community served by primary care. Um, and if you think about the communities that you live in or you've grown up in, 
Um, uh, that's actually a somewhat foreign concept to how we organize primary care in the modern age. But again, this, the Institute of Medicine, which has done a lot of writing on this uh, and, and on the future of primary care, talks about primary care being integrated, accessible, um, and accountable for addressing a large majority of the personal health care needs uh, of, of, a, of folks within a family and within a community. So that concept of community, I think, will come up again. It should be integrated to understand what that particular community is needing. Um, <clears throat> well, let me ask folks, I'm going to stop for a second, maybe pull things up. In your experience as medical students or as, uh, in, in, as, uh, in the work that you do in the health systems, um, what would you say some of the roles a primary care doc has? I mean, talk from, maybe perhaps from personal experience. I'll give you an example of perhaps um, a couple of months ago, I uh, stabbed myself with a, with a nail while I'm out in the garden. I couldn't remember when, when the last time I had a tetanus booster was. Called a primary care office, they had it on record. Saved me a trip to the emergency room. So there's just a, a gross example of something simple in, in your life experiences, how, how might you have interacted with a primary care office? Um, I can say something. Thanks, Kia. Yeah. I know, I know for a long period of time, my family, all or my siblings, at least I have three younger siblings, we all had the same primary care. And at least with the doctor we went to or the physician's assistant we went to, he kind of knew our family. Like he knew what, like when we got the stomach bug or when we got the flu and he kind of since he knew us so well he knew what steps and what we needed for care um and he knew what to do when our care was different from what might normally be seen absolutely for sure he knew you as a person right um or she knew you as a person as more typically she these days by the way um other experiences yeah I can share a little bit. Um, not really my personal experience as a patient necessarily, but uh, I mentioned earlier that I worked as a medical scribe at a community health clinic um, during my gap year. Um, and it was uh, primary care for underserved folks in Augusta, Georgia. And um, I, I like the definition you showed a couple of slides ago is basically saying that primary care physicians uh, take care of everything except for like the very rare things. And I think that pretty much described what I saw in the practice especially most of these patients not having insurance or being underinsured. Um, so you're seeing like the management of the chronic illness and sorry, they're doing some yard work outside that's um, messing up the, the audio. Um, but mentioning the chronic conditions, of course, the diabetes, the blood pressure, things of that nature, the high cholesterol, but also like different skin conditions, um, different site conditions I saw being managed by the primary care docs mm -hmm. there, um, you know, GI issues, Everything I feel like, um, you know, that, that was um, other than like the very rare things I, I feel like I saw being cared for there. So, absolutely, um, yeah, it's it pretty awesome. So, a pretty wide scope of care for sure, for sure. And challenges, whether the in in, in a uh, was it a free clinic or was it a? Um... It wasn't a free clinic, but they had a, a sliding fee scale. And yes. So, if you didn't have insurance, you kind of pay on this on the scale, and they weren't. Um, they don't send anyone to elections when sure. someone's not. No, for sure. Bill, Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so I think what we're touching on um, is um, basically a host of issues, um, getting to know a person as uh, longitudinally. But that, as Nehemiah just alluded to, is a very broad section. It can include, if you're a family practi practitioner, prenatal and maternal care, as well as early childhood care. Um, certainly, whether you're just taking care of adults or children, it's immunizations, it's mitigation of health risks. And that in children would entail lead screening, and, and for adults, of course, smoking, substance and alcohol use disorders, just wearing seat belts. You were talking about public health uh, issues with uh, Dr. Malik not long ago, wearing helmets while, while you're riding a motorbike or riding a bicycle, gun storage detection of um, these social economic determinants uh, and of, of, of health and um, the uh, unst uh, which can include unstable housing, intimate partner violence, a variety of other food insecurity. So that's part of the role. 
And again, you're also diagnosing and managing acute disorders. Um, so whether it be pneumonia, whether it be cellulitis, urinary tract infections, just to name infections, acute and uh, the, the uh, evaluation of abdominal pain, the evaluation of, of, of chest pain, um, orthopedic injuries, et cetera. This is a pretty wide scope. Add to that, as was just mentioned, managing chronic disease. You've screened for and now you've diagnosed hypertension, diabetes, dyslipidemia, mental health issues, depression, um, screening for uh, abdominal aneurysms, et cetera. This is stuff that you're learning and that you, you're aware of, um, but it falls within the scope of the primary care clinician. Lastly, again, as a geriatrician, certainly we entail uh, uh, um, um, screening and uh, management of falls and mobility issues, cognitive issues, ascertaining goals of care. What does someone uh, treasure most at the end of their life or treasure as they're dealing with illnesses and want to make priorities with? And then in the maze, of course, of American medical care, uh, how do you coordinate that? So the scope of service is um, uh, pretty considerable. Um, and if you looked at the number of diagnostic codes, so if you just look at billings done by a particular clinician in a particular area, no surprise, you'll find that the family practitioner or general practitioner will be billing for the widest degree of di diagnoses from lead screening to, uh, or, or a childhood viral exanthems in, in an infant uh, uh, to a family practitioner dealing with um, um, dementia in, in, in the elderly. Internal medicine, which is limited just to adult medicine, a little bit more uh, limited in scope, but still pretty wide compared to most other areas. And as a primary care clinician, um, uh, this is something that uh, I prided myself on, having a deep and broad uh, level of knowledge. I, I went to the University of Pennsylvania, graduated in um, 1980, and at the time, people were saying, what are you going into primary care for? Are you nuts? You know, this is a research-oriented specialty program. And, and the concept that someone might take pleasure in longitudinal experience with patients and having a broad knowledge of things um, was um, counter to what a lot of people might find they're able to, to, um, um, to manage and uh, to take pleasure in. So uh, it takes a certain person to do primary care. These days, as we'll talk about, uh, that's become even more challenging due to some external factors. Um, so what's the role of a primary care clinician within a health system? Um, and how does it affect people's lives? Um, what we're gonna talk about in the next couple of slides is um, the studies that demonstrate that primary care is the only medical specialty of which more practitioners improves longevity, equity in the health of a population. That's not new knowledge, but this is critical knowledge and this is well-founded. Um, so um, access and continuity with a high quality primary care clinician is a bedrock of high functioning healthcare systems. Um, healthcare systems have figured this out. That's just a consensus study. I made reference to it from 2021 uh, from the National Academy of Sciences on this topic. Um, the consequences when one does not have primary care, um, and actually I should probably go back a little bit. Well, let me ask you folks what the implications might be if you're in an area that has doctors, but has a sparsity of primary care clinicians. I'm using the word clinicians. It doesn't necessarily mean physicians. It can mean uh, well-trained nurse practitioners or physician assistants working typically in concert with docs. But if, the, if that primary care doc cannot be found, what might be some implications? What, what might, might be some consequences? Yeah, Nareli. Yeah, I was going to say like that for increased like emergent situations, um, including like all kinds of emergencies and... Um, also can be more fatal. So it increases like health burden and um, emergency care and like urgent care services. Sure. Can someone give an example of how a problem that might not yet be a full-blown emergency can become a full-blown emergency and, and take a life? Yeah, Selen. Yeah, I was just going to mention while you guys were talking about that, I was thinking of cancer being probably one of the biggest things in that case, because screening 
it's such a typical thing that we like enforce and we think is the usual, but people who don't have access to primary care aren't getting those screenings, aren't getting colonoscopies, everything of that sort with that comes with aging. So I think that missing these early cancer diagnoses would be a huge consequence as they would be found, like you're saying, in emergent situations later down the line. Absolutely. You could have a community that has gastroenterologists, but having access or, or understanding that, gee, I'm, I really should be having my colonoscopy now is, is another matter, right? How about other examples? I was going to mention like blood pressure monitoring and HbA1c. I feel like diabetes and hypertension can have significant consequences if they're not managed well. Absolutely. Absolutely. By the way, I, I work in, a, in, in, in literally a free clinic, which serves immigrants and folks who have uh, who fall between the cracks, which are many in the United States. Uh, here in New Hampshire, actually, this is in White River Junction in Vermont, across the river um, from where I live in New Hampshire. And I, it, I, this was recently, I saw a married couple. The woman uh, wor works uh, in retail uh, worked for Walmart in Texas, did not have um, health care, did not have health insurance. Uh, she came in, her blood pressure was 190 over 110. Uh, her hemoglobin A1C, uh, uh, for those who are not medical students, which is a measure of diabetes, was 12. Never knew she had diabetes, uh, was unaware she had hypertension. Um, and this has been going on undoubtedly for a decade or more. Um, her husband in the same state, by the way, you're gonna, this is going to floor you, um, uh, was blind. Um, he was 40, he's 48, he's not was, he is 48. He was blind because he has bilateral cataracts. Totally remedial problem. He tried to get the cataracts removed in the state of Texas. He went to a variety of, of ophthalmologists. For whatever reason, he said that he could not get them removed. He didn't. It, it was going to cost him more than he could afford, and he could. So he comes to to our clinic, sees the ophthalmologist. He said both um, uh, both both cataracts are scheduled for removal in the near future. Um, he is this particular fellow who's got bilateral cataracts is on disability. So he's but but just recently over the past year and a half, it's not long enough that he's collecting. Medicare insurance yet. That usually takes about two years of disability, but it's long enough for him to be getting some reimbursement from federal dollars for a problem that's totally remedial, but that has not happened. It also jacked up their prices, so it made probably Medicaid in that state, which did not extend Medicaid, even more distant for them to have. So it's, there's so cr crazy stuff. But anyhow, sorry to digress. <laughs> Any other thoughts that people have about primary care in terms of how it can prevent Catastrophe. Uh, yeah. I have one more thing to say. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's so hard with Zoom. I can never tell if someone's going to chime in for me. Um, but uh, with like mental health things, especially if these primary care uh, clinicians have known you for a while, they can often see like when you have a change in behavior, or if your mood starts to be affected by hormones or diet or whatever. Very well taken. And again, there's where connecting knowledge of a person. Um, you might know that, or, or actually the nurse as part of your medical team, the RN might know, this person never calls. I remember they came in and they'd had angina for three months and they decided to finally come in and have it addressed. So just knowing that this, getting a call from someone who is stoic, uh, being able to put that together, that this required, that this is not like this person. Or um, the mood, this, this mood change. This is not like this person. Um, that, that that those two things uh, run, run together in terms of recognizing uh, in your training um, when you're contending with a mental health issue, for sure. Other points, yeah, yeah. I think also okay. like being able to follow up with, if not the same provider, people who work with that provider closely. Um, I worked in a. Um, in Kentucky, they're called like the little clinic, but it's basically like a minute clinic. It's inside of a grocery store. Um, and it was all kinds of like little random stuff. And um, we saw so many people for like little things like UTIs and stuff like that. But mm -hmm. just because they got their care with us that day, didn't mean that the same nurse practitioner would be at that location the same day. 
Will they be able to talk to the same nurse practitioner again? Um, and it was like something I thought about all the time when I worked there, which was then confirmed when I went with my partner to a urogynecology um, appointment where that urogynecologist was like, where have you been going for your UTIs? Is it the little clinic? Don't do that. And, you know, we both kind of laughed and, and my partner was like, he works in a little clinic. And I was like, but it's true. <laughs> You're not wrong. Like, that's exactly what it is, you know? And problems with continuity are not unique to the little clinic, by the way. That's a real problem um, nationally uh, as well, um, for sure. So, um, yeah. So, um, basically having that continuity really is critical getting to know your patient if they come in with chest discomforts with ex exertion that could result in the myocardial infarction six months later without exertion uh, so being able to forestall critical issues uh, these minor disorders can certainly spiral into chronic disease and chronic disease management becomes more difficult and uncoordinated without primary care uh, certainly visits to emergency rooms increased, uh, colonoscopies, preventative care legs, and healthcare spending obviously also uh, soars. Um, there's a, a mixed bag as to whether you will save huge bucks by doing preventative care. Preventative care has expenses in itself. You certainly will save a lot of human misery and a lot of suffering, and ultimately, yes, save on costs, but it's a little bit uh, more nuanced than just more preventive care is less expensive. Um, but I think in general, that's probably a true statement. So primary care serves as, a, as an interface also between the social determinants of health uh, and health itself from a lot of your training. Um, and broad social solutions, of course, required to remedy these social determinants of health, whether it be racism or inadequate housing, food insecurity, um, opioid um, or, or other forms of abuse. These are societal responsibilities, but it falls upon a um, medical system, an effective medical system to improve and, and assure that we have adequate primary care. Um, so um, again, this is, I'm just going to throw out some studies um, looking how primary care improves longevity. You have population studies. So U.S. states that have a higher ratio, just simply statistically, of primary care docs per 100,000 population had, had improved all-cause uh, mortality, cardiovascular mortality, cancer mortality, stroke mortality, infant mortality, and that's independent of sociodemographic measures. So that's important. So you can be, um, and as we'll talk about within the same states, how counties that have different ratios but have the same socio-democratic uh, demographic measures um, have improved um, 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 mortality and improved longevity. Um, so lifespan correlates uh, with the number of primary care docs within a community, as does uh, birth uh, weight of interest. Um, again, from some of these studies, um, family medicine probably correlates the strongest, but it's true for many generalists. One thing to, to bear in mind, you know, that topic about how more of a primary care clinician will actually improve the general health and mortality of a population. One of the reasons that's not necessarily true with specialists is one of the issues that will drive home uh, regarding economics and supply side aspects of economics. If you have more cardiologists in a community, some of you guys are from New Jersey, from Rowan, and I'm, I, I grew up in New Jersey. I have a colleague who teaches down that way. Um, and um, there are portions of New Jersey that had huge concentrations of cardiologists. Yeah, and if you could throw a rock, you'd hit a cardiologist. Um, and so when you have more subspecialists, for them to make an income, they need to do procedures. That's what they get paid on. Um, so if somebody comes into a practice uh, that is trying to maintain its solvency, um, you're gonna be looking to do cardiac catheterizations. Now you might convince yourself you're doing the right thing by doing them, by the way, that's human nature a cognitive dissonance. But you'll see in some of those communities, if somebody burps and has chest pain, they go to cardiac catheterizations. That doesn't necessarily make much impact on longevity. And you could extrapolate this to other specialties in contrast to primary care. 
Um, and and so this fellow Winberg and uh, Dr. Malik is, uh, has his own perspectives on um, the uh, the Dartmouth Atlas uh, that was started up this way, looking at how the number of specialists within a community does not impact necessarily well on outcomes. Um, but in any case, uh, clearly it's unique to primary care. There are county level studies. Again, we're talking about studies demonstrating decrease in all cause mortality. Um, whereas, and this, some of these are done in Britain. If you add one additional general practitioner per 10,000 people within a population, uh, you'll see a 6% decrease in overall mortality. So that's only a 15 or 20% increase in the number of general practitioners within those that 10,000 people within that community makes it right away a, a significant drop. Someone mentioned, uh, I, I think, um, Selen mentioned cancer. So Florida, uh, a study was done correlating um, mortality, death from cervical cancer. Um, and the number of family docs and general internists within a community, again, if you add one third more, you'll drop the incidence of death from cervical cancer by 20%, so et cetera. There's a lot of studies and this, this is borne out um, and pretty well recognized. Um, so fewer emergency room visits, fewer surgeries. Uh, if you're able to find a colonoscopy, take out a polyp uh, at an early stage, uh, you've prevented that from turning into a, a malignancy that's gonna require a surgical resection, et cetera. So, more outcomes, uh, just to, to belabor this point, perhaps, uh, there's a federally qualified health clinics, which prioritize primary care to receive federal funding. That, that's the, by, by, by definition, they need to pr prioritize primary care. You're going to hear a lot about this in the next session coming up this afternoon. Um, and what's well demonstrated is that a population served by um, a federally qualified health center is healthier than similar communities that have comparable social deprivations, um, and people receiving care have received more preventative services in the general population. Um, again, if you look at individual level studies, so surveys asking um, about those who have a primary care doc versus those who do not, or those who have a specialist as their usual source of care. Folks who had a relationship with a primary care doc had lower five-year mortality rates, and that's controlled for demographics, health status, what diseases they may have, the smoking status, et cetera. Um, and lastly, certainly, uh, we're gonna talk about international comparators uh, as well. Um, so um, by the way, you're gonna, for those of, you're all gonna be preparing analyses of other nations' healthcare systems. Um, and so you'll be coming a lot uh, across co the Commonwealth Fund that will have a lot of references to these things. So basically to conclude, primary care is associated with improved health outcomes after a variable degree of time uh, via various studies uh, and analyses uh, and in regards to various types of outcomes, whether it be all cause mortality, heart disease, stroke, cancer, infant mortality, low birth weight, life expectancy, et cetera. The magnitude of improvement is associated with an increase of one primary care physician per 10,000 uh, population dropping mortality by at least 5.3%. And these studies suggest in the United States, you could probably have close to 130,000 deaths prevented per year if there were an increase in the number of primary care physicians. That's a pretty dramatic number. Um, how one might come to that particular term, uh, I don't have the sp specifics on, but I think it's not in trivial. Any questions on this? So how do you integrate primary care into a health system? Most developed nations provide the primary linchpin, which is universal insurance, universal health coverage, and a strong infrastructure of primary care to achieve access. So you need to match incentives for folks to practice primary care um, with um, a population size and empower that primary care clinician to take care of the folks that they serve. Um, a lot of these uh, um, international, uh, whether it be Europe, whether it be Japan, Australia, New Zealand, uh, a lot of these programs 
actually hire specialists based on the need of a community. That, as you will see, is a striking disparity with what we do in the United States. Uh, so in other words, um, a hospital or will decide, well, we need more pulmonologists. They'll work with the primary care docs to see if that, in fact, is their impression as well. And they will, so the hospitals will often be the ones that hire the specialists, um, not based on revenue that they'll bring into that hospital, but based on what community need, are, need is. There are regional stakeholders, um, such as social workers, such as um, um, uh, uh, public health programs that will work with the health professionals to balance these various resources. And primary care is linked with measures of populations. How is this population doing in terms of hypertension, in terms of stroke, in terms of a variety of other measures? So as an example in Britain, which is um, truly, that is a socialized medical program, but this also translates to many programs that are not socialized. The National Health Service of Britain centers its care on what are called primary care trusts. This entire system, the National Health System of, of Britain actually is um, distributed and funded and managed, administered through primary care. It integrates primary care in the community. It ranks the priorities of that community. That trust will hire social workers. It'll hire the specialists. It'll hire the um, abuse specialists, the um, opioid, uh, et cetera. Um, and it's also the same case in Japan, same case in Scotland, um, same case in Spain. Um, actually, in Spain, there's a national program of primary health centers around which they base their health system. It took 10 years, but after 10 years, death rates associated with hypertension, stroke, and lung cancer fell significantly more in the areas where it was first implemented than in other programs and, and than in other portions of the country. Australia links general practitioners, what they call primary care docs, with government-funded divisions of general practice. It's where a lot of the care is concentrated. Again, it is not just for wealthy industrialized nations. Uh, here are some developing countries, if you like, uh, Cuba being one of them, Costa Rica, which is perhaps a second world rather than a third world country, we're going to use such terms, and Chile. Those health systems have, in, have universal health insurance and they assure primary care for all the citizens. And in those countries, they exceed US life expectancy. They have lower infant mortality rates um, that are either the same or better. This is a chart of Latin American countries, most of which do not have national health systems. And it's no surprise that you'll see at the bottom of the chart, uh, Cuba, Chile, and Costa Rica um, having the, high, the, the highest life expectancy. By the way, um, US is probably somewhat around uh, Uruguay or Panama. Uh, and they also have the, the lowest infant mortality. So basically, um, in, in terms of um, integrating primary care within a national health system uh, to effectively support transformation and actions towards integrated health service delivery, a system-wide approach is needed, which includes all of the governmental um, functions in society um, towards um, enabling a primary care program. Um, I'm not going to belabor that. How do we do it in the U.S.? Well, um, among the um, Organization of Economic uh, Community uh, Development, um, which is um, a series of different nations or uh, developed nations around the world, um, most of those nations, um, on average, spent about 14% of their healthcare allocations on primary care. So Australia was the highest at 18%, Switzerland the lowest at 10%. US four to 6% on primary care. Um, and actually even a lesser percentage uh, on uh, older folks. So here's a graph of how we fit uh, with the OECD statistics. Um, you've got uh, Slovak Republic, uh, Switzerland, closer to where we are in Australia, Spain, it's actually quite variable, uh, Germany, Finland, 
all, um, all, all other nations, we're, we, we trail um, the OECD in terms of expenditures on primary care. Uh, and our numbers are dropping. The amount of monies expended on primary care actually dropped between 2010 and 2020. This is a little bit of an older slide. This is probably from the mid 2010s. Um, this is looking at the overall um, expenditures on healthcare. So in that big blue, dark blue section, that's hospital care. That remains the case today. That's where the brunt of care is spent. Physician services is that greenish section on the bottom. Prescription drugs is a turquoise section on, on the left bottom. And then you have primary care. Um, so um, that's a, that would be 14% uh, if you were Switzerland. We're 6%. I'm, so, I'm sorry, never mind. I'm sorry, I'm spacing out. We're five to seven percent, um, uh, probably now around four percent because this is an older slide. Um, it's it's just not sufficient. One of the other things you may not be aware of is many countries compensate primary care clinicians, physicians typically, on par with subspecialists. That's striking information for a lot of medical students uh, and a lot of uh, U.S. doctors. So the subspecialists, the cardiologists, the radiologists, the, neuro, the neurosurgeons or neurologists, they are all hired by hospitals and they are provided a similar salary to primary care, actually often less. Um, and of course, those primary care doctors in those um, uh, countries deal with less administrative burden. Um, so if you look at the number of primary care docs in France, for instance, uh, of all doctors practicing in France, 45% are primary care clinicians. Uh, it's 12% in the United States and dropping. And part of that is because how we incent people to practice, whether whether how we're paying them um, and reimbursing them. Um, so, by the way, any questions on any of this to date from what you've seen so far? Only well, it gets worse, but, you know, so. <laughs> I actually have a question about, uh, yes. you mentioned that in some systems, the specialists are hired by the hospitals and it's like based on community need. How are they able to coordinate like matching medical students interested in certain specialties with like the hospital? Like, is there, are there surpluses? In that's a perfect question, Sam. And, and we're going to touch on that, but that's that's a really terrific question that gets to the heart of coordination of a health system. So if you are most health systems on earth, you want to improve the efficiency, cost effectiveness, and outcomes of that system. You're going to do that by having more primary care docs, right? So we talked about incentivizing. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in the slides to come. But you want to make sure that, that folks are incentivized by making a good salary and having a good quality of life as clinicians. So part of that takes care of the problem itself. If you're in training and, oh, I can make more money and I think I like this and it's a, I, 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 there's a lot of things I like about this. I'm not dealing with hassles of, you know, utilization review with insurance companies, whatever, whatever it might be, it, it'll draw itself. But on the, but the, the other important issue is those countries coordinate the number of slots available and have strong incentives, if, uh, stronger than in the United States, if you go serve this underserved community, there's a province that doesn't have enough primary care docs, um, we will um, basically um, provide you additional incentives. The other thing about those nations is unlike yourselves, where you might be spending, God knows, $200,000 on a medical education, the medical education is essentially free, but in return, for, for having some of those responsibilities to serve uh, an underserved area in your first three years, for instance. Does that make sense? If you are a subspecialist, you're fascinated by pulmonology and you wanna be a pulmonologist, that's great. You can do so, but you're going to be working in a coordinated system, perhaps in a portion of Britain where there's a lot of black lung disease in, in that particular era, We're gonna because that's where they need to hire you. In the U.S., because the system is driven by economics, of a, not of not of the community, but economics of the health of the hospitals and the insurance companies, it's a very different system. 
the AMA, and we'll talk about training and how the AAMC and var a variety of different educational uh, graduate programs allocate the number of slots in the U.S., but it is not coordinated with need. And there's there's bills in Congress to try and accomplish that. But does that make sense? It's a very different system. It does. Thank you. Um, that's a terrific question, and we will touch on that. So, you know, one of the things I think that happens in the beginning of this program for you guys of the internship is you may not have big pictures. And if uh, I do want to maybe tomorrow, I'll give you some big pictures about statistics about how much we're spending in the United States and where allocations are going, and what kinds of insurance are responsible for that. But by the way, this is the reality. We spend four point seven trillion dollars. That's a few bucks on health care in the United States. Trillion dollars. And of course, as you probably know, we'll see this slide again. Uh, we spend more than uh, twice that of other de of other developed nations. So if this top red uh, bar is the United States in terms of health care costs per capita per person in the United States, compared to nations like Japan, um, Australia, which are spending half as much but having twice as uh, uh, longevity and, and outcomes that are really appreciably better. Um, our health care is no better and often worse. And by the way, we're going to also talk about how that is varies regionally. If you're in one portion of the United States, your health care may not be worse than that of another country. That's general taking the average of the of American communities. But again, when you have an uncoordinated system, you have communities that have such huge disparities. Um, so we talk about how primary care touches our lives. I thought this was an interesting chart. This is one of your references. These boxes represent the number of persons who are being uh, uh, um, seen uh, within a year um, by different points of care within a healthcare system. By that, if you have a hundred, I'm sorry, if you have a thousand people who are in a particular part, uh, let's say of the US in a particular town, 800 of those people may report symptoms to the doctor's office. Oh, I, I you know, I, I think I have the flu. Can you call in some Tamiflu for me? Um, or this, that, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm mistaken here. 800 people will, will have symptoms from the flu or some other illness or something else. If you survey them, they developed a medical issue. 327 of those folks will consider seeking medical care for those symptoms that they were, that they will report in the course of a year. Of those 327, 217 will visit a doctor's office. And um, more than slightly more than half will visit a primary care doctor's office. 65 might visit a complementary alternative medical care provider. 21 visit uh, an outpatient clinic in a hospital. 14 receive home health care because they're um, have chronic medical conditions. 13 may visit an emergency department, eight may be hospitalized, and maybe less than one will be hospitalized in an academic medical center. So if you think of those who are visiting a doctor's office, at least half of those are visiting a primary care office in the United States. Many more of those folks would be seen by a primary care doctor's office in other communities, but clearly primary care is a high touch um, practice. In the United States, we are dealing currently with a real shortage. Can I ask you guys, um, folks, have you heard your folks, your, your your parents mentioned that they had difficulty finding a primary care doc? Yeah, I see at least a couple nods, a few nods. This is a reality, not just up here in rural New Hampshire and, and Vermont, it's nationwide uh, and um, it's um, accelerating. So we are finding that 30% um, of Americans do not have a usual source of care. Um, and the percentage of Americans uh, who have an ongoing relationship with the doctor has dropped over the course of the uh, 20 years. Uh, and this is a, a graph. In 2021, 70% um, uh, 70, uh, 70 of, of Americans actually had someone they identified as a usual source of care. Um, 100 million Americans live in primary care shortage areas. And here's a graph of that. Uh, the orange is folks who are in areas with shortages. 
Alaska has some major cities, but overall, the population of folks who live in Alaska is pretty um, poor to find primary care docs. Um, and that would, but surprisingly, that applies for a lot of other uh, states, including um, Texas, Nevada, Wyoming, um, et cetera. Um, and the current projections are a shortage of 70,000 primary care physicians. That's not uh, ARNPs, but physicians uh, by 2036. So there's been a decades of, of underinvestment. Um, and uh, some of the reasons um, uh, we'll get to. But here's just another graph of the percentage of the US population with a usual source of care. As no surprise, if you don't have um, health insurance, that's that orange graph on the bottom, um, less than 40% of people will have a, a primary care doc they can go to. Doesn't mean that you have less medical conditions or less critical medical problems. Just means you don't have a doctor to, to, to see uh, for those issues. Uh, Medicare, again, the US does pretty good with Medicare. Um, uh, those with private insurance uh, have less uh, uh, coverage with a primary care clinician than others. Also, no surprise, uh, the percentage of Americans who have a usual source of care, have a primary care doc, varies by race and ethnicity. Again, a lot of that has to do with the fact we don't have universal health care. Um, so these same statistics uh, you'll see on the bottom graph that happens to be folks who are Latino or Hispanic. Uh, and um, uh, you have a, a disparity there. So the U.S. is failing its residents in providing primary care, and much of that is related to disparities uh, in care based on lack of insurance, income, as well as uh, states' inability to ex or in unwillingness to ex to expand Medicaid, as it might be, through the Accountable Care, uh, Affordable Care Act, um, as well as um, institutional longstanding. Uh, issues of racism and other matters. So, whoops. Um, so, these are some comparisons uh, of the United States health uh, system in primary care. As we discussed, Americans are least likely to have a regular physician or place of care. Here we fall on a graph. The U.S. is as obvious as you could see compared to much of the industrialized world. Here is, um, um, again, a similar graph. The, I think the former graph was folks who had a long-term um, uh, relationship. So the percentage of adults who have a regular doctor place who've been the, with them for five years or more, we were talking about the importance of continuity. So we trail the developed world in terms of folks who know their doctor and their doctor knows them. And this is just in terms of um, having an, uh, a, a regular doctor that you know you can be seen by. I was surprised by Sweden. Now, Sweden has actually a very good health system. And that's there on the left below the US. I don't know what that's all about, whether it's recent immigration or, or other kinds of surveys. That, 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 that was, uh, we'll have to research that. Um, this is um, home visits. By the way, have any of you had home visits when you were growing up? I, I have to share with you a, a longitudinal aspect of American medical care. And it's not unique to me. When I was a child, I had chicken pox, I had German measles, I had measles, I had this, that, and the other thing. Growing up as a kid, the pediatrician I had did not want me to go to their office and give the other kids in their waiting room chicken pox unless their parents wanted me to do that. Um, he made a home visit. Um, that was routine for my generation. This is striking. This is still the case in many other nations. Home visits don't make much money because of the way that they've been um, billed and the way that, that one can bill for them for health systems. They don't make a lot of bucks for insurers, but they it's totally appropriate care. When I was growing up and I talk with friends, that was our usual experience. That is the experience in many other nations. The fact that it's not now in the United States uh, reflects our system, does not reflect uh, um, appropriate health care. So this is just looking at statistics in terms of um, home visits, whether it be actually for seniors and, and the elderly, uh, or it be uh, kids with uh, with childhood exanthems or, or rashes. Um, again, um, we do well, and in part because of your training. You have excellent training. 
uh, American doctors do very well in screening for your socioeconomic determinants of health. Um, you're looking um, for a variety of different issues, whether it be intimate partner violence or be food insecurity or inability to afford medications. Maybe it's because we have to be asking those questions more than in the other countries, but, but we certainly do better in that. And also, um, American physicians do pretty well in coordinating care with specialists in hospitals. Um, so that's also a plus with our system. But clearly, our availability of primary care docs is problematic. And again, we're talking about coordinating care as a national health system. There is no single agency in the United States that designs or monitors a primary care clinician workforce. With everything else we've said, that's pretty striking. Um, and again, it reflects where we are in, in terms of um, our quote unquote system. Uh, this is social workers, this is other stuff. Uh, that's coordination of care. So you've all seen these graphs, I think, um, perhaps not. So I'll, I'll introduce them here if you haven't. This is life expectancy at birth um, between 1980 and 2022 as compared to other nations. And the US is here in green, that's the green line. By the way, we have always had disparity in the United States. There's always been more so than other nations. We've had huge disparity. But if you look at 1980, we were within the pack when it comes to longevity. If you go and, and back, if you, this also holds true back in the 1970s. We were also, by the way, within the pack when it came to, to um, expenses, to how much we expended of our GDP on healthcare. We fell out of the pack um, starting around the 1990s. Is that only because of primary care um, deficits? No, there's other factors at play, no doubt. But not having universal health care and not having primary care as part of that is part of it. Um, so we certainly, our, our um, uh, life expectancies is, is clear. And this is before COVID, by the way. This was back in the 2014 when, when our life expectancy first started to drop off in contrast to other countries. That's a striking damnation, of, uh, unfortunately, of, of our health non-system. We have a whole series of metrics um, this is, again, life expectancy compared to health spending. Uh, the, the graph bars on the right is how much a, a country spends on health care per capita. On the left is life expectancy. We pay more, we, we, we live less. <laughs> um, but also, of course, we have higher infant mortality. We talked about Chile. Uh, we are behind that of Costa Rica uh, and, and similar uh, to Cuba. Um, and again, um, a lot of this has to do with zip code. What's your best predictor of life expectancy and outcomes? Um, it's really more where you live rather than anything else. Um, and again, this is looking at infant mortality across the United States. These are the number of deaths per thousand. Um, Mississippi uh, and uh, is, is, uh, leads the pack. <laughs> Louisiana, you're off the hook and Tulane for a little bit. But uh, certainly, it's, it's, um, th there are huge variations. Um, and this is looking at life expectancy, again, uh, correlates fairly similarly. Um, so I, this is an important cross-national statistic, which is mortality amenable to health care. What this means is a measure of deaths before age 75 that occurs from complications of a condition that can be effectively treated and from for which you can prevent death from occurring. So for example, stroke. Most strokes are associated with uncontrolled hypertension on average. There are variables, there's atrial fibrillation. You can prevent stroke from atrial fibrillation. There's a variety of different disorders that if you treat the underlying medical condition, um, you'll prevent the mortality. Um, so in my mind, it's one of the most important statistics that reflects how primary care serves a community or, or a nation. And again, the U.S. is, is bleakly here on the right side, uh, leading the world in mortality amenable to health care. Um, and again, I think that's not a surprise, uh, given the dearth of primary care clinicians. 
This is just another statistic, again, from the Commonwealth Fund. Uh, here's the U.S. looking at healthcare spending compared to performance using a variety of measures. And again, if, if you're in certain communities, you're not down there. You may be up here, but, but the nation as a whole, on average, the statistical um, uh, variance eliminated puts us back in that area. So if you consider value of a healthcare system, how that system achieves outcomes versus how many dollars you spend to get that outcome, we ain't doing so hot. And I think that's why many of you are here for this program and to be able to advocate for change. So I think you're aware of these things. Um, and again, um, we do pretty well with care process. We talked about integrating care within a health system. If you're a primary care doc working for a health system, you can usually get folks in with the specialists and coordinate with the specialists. That's a good thing. We do well with care process. You can analyze whether you could understand if a person has critical needs outside of the medical system. We do pretty well there. But in terms of access, in terms of administrative efficiency, equity, and ultimate outcomes, we don't do so hot. So somebody had mentioned um, COVID, I think, in the previous session. This is not a surprise to you. Um, we, we did not perform well with COVID, um, and there's no surprise there. This is a mortality of number of deaths per 100,000. This is the case fatality, the observed case fatality ratio. That is, if you came into a hospital with COVID, we did okay. We're here. Um, we're in the middle of the pack as to how people survive. But if you look at how many people in America die, that is, may not have been served adequately by getting in for their treatment, um, we did not do very well. Um, so um, we are, uh, let's see, what time we finish up at uh, 2.30? That sound right? Okay. So these are, uh, again, um, someone asked about the factors um, that contribute to um, shortage of primary care clinicians in terms of um, education, or perhaps it was, I don't remember who, who asked about that, but reimbursement. This is something um, that you might not be aware of. Many of the doctors you work with have never heard of these folks. We're trying to change that. There is a committee known as the Relative Value Scale Update Committee. It's a group of 32 voting members convened by the American Medical Association that sets American physician salaries. Um, how many of you were aware of that going into this? How many of you heard of this? That's about right. Uh, Norella, you, looks, you, you, you had heard of it. That's terrific. Because that's, that's unusual. Many doctors have never heard of these folks. This is a committee that gives annual advice to the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. That's, that's who controls basically Medicare and sets the reimbursement for Medicare and Medicaid throughout the nation. So these recommendations, this is how much I think one should be reimbursed for performing an appendectomy. This is the billing that, th this is the reimbursement. This is how much I think somebody should be reimbursed for spending half an hour managing somebody's diabetes, a cognitive service, or finding out if somebody has depression, or zapping a wart on a hand. How much should you get reimbursed for filling up a liquid nitrogen gun and zapping something for 15 seconds. So all these different elements of, of care are reimbursed based on the RVUs that this committee designs. Of those 32 voting members, 27 are specialists, radiologists, neurosurgeons, neurologists, pulmonologists, cardiologists, et cetera. So no surprise that there are some built-in conflicts of interest. As we'll talk about, the American Medical Association is a physician lobby. It has, by its origins, been designed to serve physicians' interests. And who has the greatest power within such a lobby? Those who make the greatest amount of bucks to contribute to that lobby and to have influence in that lobby. So one of the reasons that the United States is poorly coordinated in terms of primary care is just one of the elements, not a chief element necessarily. What is this aspect of reimbursement for, for the services that we that we provide? Um, so there's that recommendation made to, to the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, um, CMS. 
equally, if not more important, is commercial health insurers will typically pay anywhere between 100 to 330 percent higher for specialists' reimbursement than what these benchmarks are from the, RV, the, the relative value committee. Why? Why would a commercial insurer pay more for a cardiologist above what Medicare would normally reimburse? Because they are competing financially with other insurers. And they have assumed that primary care docs are interchangeable. And yeah, we have a provider. That's what providers are. You're a primary care doc. Well, they, they all get paid the same. But if we have a limited market, we want to advertise our knee replacements with the best orthopedists and our cardiac surgery with the best cardiothoracic surgeons and our cardio. So, so there's a competition to sell their insurance plans based on high tech, which is, again, a, a, a very typical of American aspects of care. Um, the reimbursement for cognitive services is about 10%, 5 to 10% higher than it might be for, for the benchmark for uh, made, made to Medicare. Is that changing now that we have a shortage? Barely. Will it change? Who knows? It's got to eventually, you would think, but this is not a free market. If we're a free market and, and a typical system where free market principles are applicable, this would have changed 15, 20 years ago. But the nature of, of, of medical care, it, it's not translatable in terms of how uh, markets work, as we'll see in some of the um, sessions that we'll get to. So anyhow, um, reimbursement is, is certainly problematic. The other issue at play is how hospitals are reimbursed in the United States. They are not given global budgets by a federal program coordinating care in the United States. They are led by hospital boards that have that have cut their teeth, teeth in business and finance. They're executives from the business world. These are nonprofit tax exempt hospital boards, but they're led by folks from the business world. That is the reality of the current world of, that we live in. So they emulate the tactics of the for-profit hospitals that they're competing with, whether it be Health Corporation of America or Tenant, as well as other aspects of, of a financialized world that we live in. Their goal is to maximize hospital revenue. If a commercial insurer is paying more for a knee replacement than it is for your for preventing somebody, well, or more for bypass surgery, which is a better example, then it might be for, for reimbursing the, the primary care doctor to treat the person's diabetes, hypertension, and cholesterol effectively, so they don't need that bypass surgery, the hospital gets reimbursed more. Have you ever seen billboards for knee replacements? Or we have the best cardiologists in whatever the community you live. There's a reason those billboards exist. That's because that's where the hospital gets its revenue. That's where it makes its big bucks because of how commercial insurers bill above what the benchmarks are, as well as what the benchmarks themselves are. Does that make sense? That is a reality of, of the American health system. Health systems boost elective surgical procedures because they're most highly reimbursed at the expense of primary care. And I'll give you some examples of that from my own experience. Um, one other issue in terms of reasons for the shortage is administrative burden and the burden of, of doing primary care, and I've seen this in my own life and my own practice throughout my experiences as, as a primary care physician. When I went into medicine, healthcare was still dominated by the concept that it is a public good. And that it is the folks who run the hospitals are, are the clinicians or community members who are not trying to compete on the basis of revenue. They're trying to, to serve a community. Unfortunately, uh, healthcare is transformed into a large commercial enterprise where corporations and hospital systems view primary care as producers of a product line. That's where we're at. Um, the other major impact on a lot of older clinicians, not so much your generation, but the electronic medical record, which is a terrific thing. It is great to be able to go online, look up what your next appointment is, communicate with your doctor online, uh, uh, 
um, correct if the medication list is incorrect. This is a, a, pull up your lab results. There's a lot of reasons we have electronic medical records. Um, th those are good things. The problem is when they were introduced, hospitals got reimbursed to provide electronic medical records, um, but they didn't specify how they would be provided. They were not provided. They were not uh, released as clinician tools like a stethoscope. They were released as billing mechanisms so that physicians, and, and oftentimes uh, all physicians, but if the burden fell mostly on the primary care doc, was to capture all the billing one could. And they were, they, they were very bulky and, and directed towards billing rather than uh, using them as a tool to, to improve care. So um, we became provider clerks. Um, the visits became abbreviated while serving older and more uh, complicated patients. Um, so burnout was a consequence of some of these issues. And a lot of this was also our dissatisfaction in being unable to provide the care we wanted to provide in, in the setting of a commercial transaction that was being um, uh, imposed on us as, as primary care docs. Um, we had profit-generated restrictions, pri uh, prior authorizations. We had to jump through hoops just to get a, an appropriate test ordered or try to figure out what medication a particular patient needed on that patient's insurance formulary. It, it was not easy and, and it's never been more difficult actually today figuring out which medications a particular insurer will carry or, or will not of a, of a group of medicines. So this inability to provide medical services has also resulted in this concept of moral injury and, and, um, and problems. If you look at who gets burned out by this, in terms of uh, American clinicians, it's typically emergency room medicine first, and that may be for a variety of reasons, but then it's followed by uh, the four subspecialty practices, internal medicine, pediatrics, OBGYN, and family medicine, because we're having to jump through hoops, because, and again, internal medicine, where you're just dealing with adults, often uh, older adults, you have a lot of tests to order. That's a lot of clicks. Uh, that, that, that's a lot of diff different interventions one need make. Uh, oncologists, a substantial amount of burnout for that same reason, trying to get the best chemotherapeutic agent covered for your patient when they may have a private insurance that's not covering it and having you jump through hoops to provide the care that you need. This is another, this is, a, this is from the Annals of Internal Medicine just from last month. So I pulled this up. This is basically the experience of a primary care doc, uh, perhaps during the lunch hour and the uh, nurse at the top is saying, oh, uh, all these um, uh, GLP-1 agonists, all the patients are calling about Trulicity or Zempic. They're calling because the meds are on back order. What can they use instead? And the other secretary on the side is, your 10 o'clock patient just walked in. He was stuck in traffic, went to the wrong office. He has surgery in two days. He has to be seen for pre-op. What do you want to do for that? Then you have the bond. The CAT scan order was canceled by your insurance company because you didn't put in the right uh, paperwork to get the prior authorization, et cetera, et cetera. So there's, there's a lot of response. And having done this for a lifetime, when I started practice, um, most internists did it all. We saw patients in the outpatient realm and we ran across the street to admit our patient in the emergency room if they're our patient. And actually we ran across the street to see our patients at lunchtime to discharge them or to manage their medical issues as they arose. So initially, but this is before the age of hospitalists, primary care docs, this is many family practitioners did this as well. And pediatricians did this. We had an outpatient realm. We had an inpatient realm. If we had to deal with prior authorizations to the extent we do today, deal with a lot of the non-medical nonsense that the insurance industry has imposed on physicians, we could not have even considered doing that. Um, so it's, uh, the, the impact on our lives with non-medical matters is, is quite striking. Anyhow, um, so consequence early retirement, um, fewer doctors. By the way, not just fewer physicians. All the things we've talking about also applies to nurse practitioners and physician assistants. There, it's across the boards. There are fewer clinicians entering primary care for all these same reasons. By the way, the number of nurse pr practitioners and PAs are increasing steadily, but fewer are going into primary care. As was asked about previously, about who go, why do people select the, the subspecialty they goes in, they, they, they may enter in. 
less than 20% of all medical residency graduates enter primary care. And it's this is a graph. On the left is some time ago, 1951, when 93% of, of physicians who left internal medicine, that particular field of medicine, would, would become primary care internists. Look at that graph. <laughs> Uh, right now, it's dropped to 9.4%. And so I still teach residents at, at the medical center who are in the primary care tract. But there are fewer and fewer of these folks who are toughing it out and, and, and uh, in their experience. Um, we talked about debt and compensation. Um, and also, it's interesting. It depends on, on, on who you talk with. Even in academic circles, I think that colleagues really do have great respect for the primary care doc who's taking good care of their patients and sends appropriate referrals. And really, because they understand the huge scope that we need to contend with. By the way, in your careers, undoubtedly, and we'll have a, a, a lecture on this, I think, you'll be using AI when you're matching the human genome of the patient you're seeing, maybe the AI will be telling you what disease states to be keeping an eye out for. So maybe it'll get simpler, maybe not. Um, but I think that there's a variable degree of respect, and I don't know what you're seeing in medical schools where you're at. Uh, out of curiosity, have you um, any examples of what you're hearing in terms of overall perspectives about specialties. Is that something that you, you guys have encountered? I'll just I'll open it up and curious. We're going to take a break soon. <laughs> but yeah, Stephen. I can I can share a little bit. Oh, mm -hmm. oh, oh sorry. I can wait. Go ahead guys. What you... you can go okay. ahead. Okay. Um I mean from my personal experience thus far I just finished my first year of medical school. I will say um I have kind of gotten some of that vibe at least at my school, which is a lot of good things I can say about my school, but I think the demographic of our student body is more specialty focused. And it's kind of more of a, a niche thing to be desiring to go into primary care, um, which, you know, I thought like would be a different experience if I was at uh, you know, uh, a medical school that emphasized and prioritized primary care. So um, I don't think it's been like, uh, downright, outright disrespectful, but it's kind of like just in the air a little bit of like, oh, okay, you, like you don't get paid as much. That kind of thing. Absolutely. Very well taken. So in a world where income and corporate prestige takes precedence, um, that does invariably translate to how one might view a specialty, um, for sure. So Stephen, you're going to say something um, as well. Yeah. Um... So firstly, I definitely echo that with my med school experience. It seems like there's a bigger focus, both from the student end of doing specialties, but also when they're going out and exploring, like shadowing, it seems like there's a little bit more like, I guess like lack of a better term, almost like poaching students to certain specialties. Cause it'll be specialties be like, oh, you know, you can make like 500K if you do anesthesia. And then like a bunch of students like, oh, that sounds great. And then they start gravitating, gravitating towards that early on in their career, even before we do um, the clinical rotations. Um, but then also where I worked in uh, rural Oregon, I worked for um, a family practice clinic. And one of the providers I worked with for over a year, she was a PA. And I remember um, like they were talking, um, her and some of the other like PAs and doctors and she was mentioning how like, if she had to go through med school instead of PA school, she definitely would not have touched primary care or family practice. Um, she was like, yeah, no, like compensation wise to go through all that schooling and then make primary care salary versus making like neurology salary. Like it just wouldn't be worth it in that case. Mm -hmm. Thank you both. Um, and that's very well taken. In fact, um, the people used to talk about a, 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 a brain drain of clinicians from Canada into the United States because of these, these um, discrepancies and lack of return on investment of doing your medical training to become a primary care clinician, plus the burden of administrative uh, care that we need to deal with. Actually, 
primary care docs are going to Canada. It's been the opposite direction uh, for all these reasons. So, and hopefully in your careers, there'll be some recognition of this and, and some changes. Um, and again, you do what you love. I mean, you, clearly uh, you, you will enter uh, hopefully what what your passion is. Uh, but I think it'll clearly, some of this will work itself out. Uh, it has to, um, one hopes. Anyhow, so, um, and medical school exposure, hopefully many of you will be having enough time in a primary care setting, you'll be able to see this. Um, we're just talking about earnings, plastic surgery, 600K at the top, pediatrics, 250K at the bottom. Uh, this is not based on societal need or what serves a society best. It's based on a very different level of, of factors. So there's been a variety of measures um, instituted in an effort to strengthen primary care. Again, um, too little, too late. Um, the Affordable Care Act did have some expansion of primary care via federal qualified health centers. It clearly expanded Medicaid, so it in, in expanded insurance, uh, and did provide um, some meaningful use uh, was the terminology given towards expanding electronic medical records as part of it. Um, but most of the recommendations regarding primary care were not followed. Um, uh, it did also expand somewhat professional shortage area bonus programs or, or incentives to increase funding by Medicare, by CMS, to folks who are practicing in shortage areas. But it, again, is, is not enough to actually make much impact. And as is often the case in, in underserved areas, international med medical graduates will be serving many of these communities, um, in part because of incentives such as the Conrad 30 program. If, if you're an inter internationally trained medical graduate, you still have to complete a residency in the United States. Um, but you have a what's called a J-1 visa. So after your residency, you have to uh, leave the U.S. Um, for a period of time. Um, before you're allowed to, to come back. There's a waiver for that um, necessity to, to leave the U.S. if you serve in an underserved area. So there's a variety of other measures that are being attempted to uh, improve service in um, underserved communities. But um, so what are some examples of programs that do work? Uh, in the United States, we do have an example of a single payer system. It's called the Veterans Administration um, and so the VA system, where, which is a coordinated system to enhance outcome rather than finances, um, actually has what are called patient-aligned care teams that are well reimbursed, they're well supported, they provide comprehensive care in partnership with patients and their, those patients' caregivers, and they use something called the patient-centered medical home, which we'll touch on. Um, so there's an example where, and many, by the way, veterans are, if once they get into care, can be very happy with their care and very satisfied with care at home and home programs and the like. This concept of the medical home, have, how many of you have heard of a medical home in reference to primary care? Just out of curiosity. One, two, three, four, five. Great. So so it's it's not six. It's not totally foreign. That's good. So this is a concept based on the principles of primary care where there's an ongoing relationship with a personal clinician within a doctor-directed team. And most importantly, there's active involvement of that team or clinician across points of care. By that, I mean, when I have a patient who I've gotten to know in the office and they are hospitalized, I will visit them in the hospital. I, I'm not going to be billing for the hospital visit per se, but I know what's befalling them. I'm going to pick up sooner than the than the team that may see them for a week before another team comes on board or has never seen them before. I'll know if that patient's depressed. I'll know if that patient's issues are new. So I, I will follow that patient. When that patient is then discharged to a um, skilled nursing facility, I may be the one who's following there. I may actually be the one who's billing as a geriatrician. I may actually be taking care of that patient at that discharge. Um, so, and, and if that same patient goes on to hospice and they're receiving care at the end of life, um, 
at least my team or clinicians from my team will be responsible for their care. So that that's that concept of a medical home that has that kind of degree of continuity. It also serves enhanced um, features of quality and safety. And, and um, there's a program which is NCQA, uh, which is a, a non-government organization. It's not funded by the government, but it promotes and certifies medical practices to become primary care medical homes. And so certainly the VA has done that. Um, states may also incentivize things. Vermont has been very good at this with Blueprint for Health. Your states may have some programs trying to improve the amount of, of primary care that's being offered. Unfortunately, health systems, for the reasons we've talked about, seem to emphasize reimbursement and revenue um, or exit. They don't make profits if it's a nonprofit system. They're just making excess revenue. And they have looked at primary care as loss leaders. They're the programs that they need just to make the referrals to their to their subspecialists, but they are not actually incentivizing uh, proper uh, uh, primary care. And the one agency that we do have as a nation, which is CMS, has the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. They have had limited initiatives, some of which we'll learn about later in this course, to strengthen primary care. Again, it's been um, too little. So this is just the concept of a primary care medical home where you have an accountability of that team, that's the primary care team, for the care throughout a variety of different points of care, where you're coordinating care throughout that and you're looking at the whole person. I'll give you um, an example in my own career. So um, when I first came up to Dartmouth, myself and some colleague geriatricians, we set up a medical home. We got certified as such. We followed our own patients into the nursing facilities. We would visit them in the hospital. Initially, we were doing the hospitalization, but then they were taken over the hospitals, which was fine. But we knew that patients at various points of care. We had nurses, our RNs, were working at the top of their license. If a patient with dementia called the secretary, with a complaint, the secretary might know that patient had dementia. She would put it right off to the RN and the RN would call the family member. Um, what happened in, in a program that was in, in a health system, an academic health system that was under stress financially, it figured out, well, we can save on the amount of money we're expending on these RNs and secretaries working in this primary care practice if we put them into a call center. So they hired four high school graduates, trained them how to handle a call, put them in a windowless room in a different building, elsewhere in the, in, in, divorced from where our RNs were. And then you had the patient with dementia calling with a complaint. The, the secretary had no idea whether this patient had dementia or not because patients mask it extremely well. They'll make an appointment, but the patient won't show because they didn't know to call the family member because they, they didn't have any really any connection with the primary care home. And I took this, as, so th there was an illustration where efficiency to serve revenue is counter to the outcome of a primary care system. This I took out of the Washington Post from just a couple of days ago. This is June 15th. This is these large nationwide um, Amazon's one medical system. These are call centers nationwide where they're realizing that these things are happening about chest pain, not just for the patient who has dementia, you don't know to contact the family member, where there's critical issues falling between the, 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 the cracks. That is really the antithesis of, of what a medical home should be. Um, so that is some, one of the things we're facing. Oak Street, um, so, so the role of private equity in taking over primary care has really been quite striking in recent years. Um, these are private equity firms that, that you know, make the big bucks. Um, they're hiring primary care clinicians in medical centers across states, across state lines, um, and acquiring them for billions of dollars. This is how we have evolved in terms of uh, our, 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 our health systems, or lack thereof. Um, you can imagine how that might serve um, uh, uh, our, our patients. United Health Group. It's the fifth largest public company in the United States. It's a conglomerate that is not just a health insurer. 
it has the pharmacy benefit managers that coordinates and provides the medications and comes up with the formularies. It has surgical centers, it has urgent care centers, it's home health care centers, hospice agencies, mental health agencies. And, and I don't know how many of you heard about what happened with Change Healthcare. It owns Change Healthcare, which is a billing program that got hacked, that was preventing doctors from across the country from, from getting paid for months at a time. That happened earlier this year. So you have this huge conglomerate that is sort of a single payer system in its own right, but motivated by how much its stock is worth on Wall Street. That is now the largest employer of primary care physicians in the United States. Think about that. So um, uh, again, it doesn't necessarily mean that the priorities may be cockeyed. But if one is a primary care doctor working for a publicly traded organization that's competing with other health conglomerates, think about what might be some of the pressures that are put upon you as a primary care doc. Anybody have any guesses? To see as many patients as possible in your day. No question. So that can boost revenue by seeing more patients. You do more billing on that basis. Sure. Uh, you might be incentivized to like kind of bail for treatments or recommend procedures that boost more revenue rather than actually do like the patient's health justice. Absolutely. If you get paid 85 bucks to zap a wart that takes you five seconds, you're going to be looking for warts. And if it's going to take you half an hour to educate a patient with diabetes, how to manage their diabetes, um, you're going to have to, you may be having to weigh that. Now that's true. That's not just unique to health insurers, by the way, that could be true for any program that's really putting pressure on doctors to maximize revenue, but well taken. If, 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 if your, your CEO is trying to, to boost the price of their stock, there's going to be more pressure to accomplish that. Any other thoughts about working when a health insurer, yeah, go ahead, Hamza. Uh, maybe like geographically deciding where are the best clinicians to be located. Maybe this clinic is not making as much. Let's just close it. All these people are in another place. Very important point. If you are trying to maximize profit, you're not going to be serving an underserved community that or, or that's going to have more socioeconomic needs. And you're going to be serving the middle class or the upper middle class community in that same city. You're not going to locate in, in a, a section of town where folks have more medical problems. You want to basically do boo boo care, right? And 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 boost your 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 revenues. You certainly don't want to. You're only going to be serving people who have insurance, right? You're not going to be serving the underinsured. You don't make any money on that. But the issue about where you refer is very critical. Remember, a health um, insurer like United Health has limited networks. They, if you're, uh, if you have that health insurance, you can't go outside that network without paying for it. Uh, then it's on, you're on your own, right? So United Health will hire the cardiologists in a particular area. They'll hire the oncologists in a particular area. If you have a patient whose oncologists are not experienced with a particular problem, but there's a great oncologist in town who has been managing the sarcoma for years and they have the best outcomes in the, in, in the country, you may not be able to refer to that doc because it's not covered. Does that make sense? Or your, your other incentives are going to be based around other is issues. Certainly, um, these, are, these are other issues we'll be tackling. But so, so it is a real issue that's, that I think we're going to be facing in our lifetimes. Um, any other thoughts? So we're, we're, we're winding down. I know you guys need bio breaks, I am sure. Thank you for your patience. Your butts might be sore. I'm sorry about that. Um, but we're just finishing up. Um, so this aspect of financialization of, pri of primary health care is, is really creating um, uh, major changes with, with burnout. And if you're working as a clinician, you might unionize. We're going to have a lecture uh, on that topic of young doctors who are actually forming unions to protect not their salaries per se, but to protect the interests of their patients. Uh, against some of these forces. 
So basically, I think the crisis in primary care in the United States really touches on some of the key flaws of absence of a health system in the United States. What we've discussed is that most developed nations provide universal health insurance, and they center a true health system on primary care and community needs. The US health industry is centered on revenue of either the hospital, which is a closed local health system, or the profit of the insurer, or a public health program like Medicare, which is beholden to both of those elements. Um, and I think that um, with government acqu acquiescence over the past 40 years, uh, we have evolved as a health system to maximize profit rather than outcome. Um, and what we've seen is corporations and private equity are dictating the management of primary care rather than maximizing health outcomes. And um, so hopefully we will be 